I wanted to first remind you of this broader picture of the steps before we continue on with step six. So next we're gonna find the p-value. So let's talk about how to do that. So in finding a p-value, let's define this. In a hypothesis test, the p-value is the probability of getting a value of the test statistic that is at least as extreme as the test statistic obtained from the sample data. This is again, assuming that the null hypothesis is true. And still, as we're getting used to null hypothesis and alternative hypothesis, recall that the null hypothesis or H naught is the symbolic expression that the parameter equals the fixed value being considered. Okay, so for a p-value, we first assume the null hypothesis to be true. Then we think about the probability of getting a value of the test statistic that is at least as extreme as the test statistic obtained from the sample data. Now, this is a fairly dense definition, so let's practice doing this. So again, we're getting more context on how to apply step six, but more specifically, how to obtain that value for P. Now, I'll talk you through how I find the P value using Excel. You could also do this manually, but I highly recommend you use Excel. Let's go through again what we know. So for this example problem, we found that test statistic, we found the Z value to be equal to 2.55. Remember we did so by being more accurate here. So we found the Z value of 2.55 by using the unrounded version of the proportion. So we're using the more accurate version here rather than 2.54. Now in step five, we also classified our proportion example as a normal distribution. So with the normal distribution and this value of Z, then this should start to sound familiar. We can actually find the cumulative area to the left of that given Z score, given that we have a standard normal distribution. Why does knowing that we have a standard normal distribution help? Well, that gives us a value for the mean and the standard deviation. So this is how I do it in Excel. I wrote my mean and my standard deviation specifically for a standard normal distribution. Why do I also know I can use a standard normal distribution here? Well, because we're working in terms of a z-score. So we found a z-score of 2.55. Keeping in mind the terminology, the z-score was our test statistic. So my z-value here is 2.55. Also then to set up this normal distribution function, I need to give my function a cumulative value. I don't wanna know an area at a single value. I wanna know a whole range of values, right? So my cumulative value then would be equal to one rather than equal to our other option of zero. So given a mean, a standard deviation, an X value or a Z value of interest and a cumulative value, I can use the normal distribution function in Excel that we've done before. Here, my X, the first number that goes into this is 2.55. And I set this up by typing an equal sign N-O-R-M dot D-I-S-T. So an X value of 2.55, a mean of zero, standard deviation of one, then my cumulative value also of one. Remembering that the tables in our book and using Excel always give us this area in reference as the cumulative area from the left. So if we have our cumulative area from the left, we have to ask, are we done at this point? How we decide that is going back and looking at those tailed tests and looking at this value, this meaning of our alternative hypothesis. For our specific alternative hypothesis, an H1 value is P is greater than 0.5. I went back to this slide now because we need to know, are we interested in these two areas, just the area on the left or just our area on the right? To decide this, we need to look at our alternative hypothesis, H1. For our drone example, H1 is P is greater than 0.5. For cases when P is greater than 0.5, then we see this symbol here for greater than. With this symbol here for greater than, which I looked at by finding my alternative hypothesis back in step three, then connecting that here where P is greater than 0.5, then I'm using this right tailed test 
I'm interested in the right hand side of this curve. Maybe even more straightforward, I wanna know if my P value is greater than 0.5. Well, then I'm interested on this side of the curve because values that are greater are on the right hand side of the curve. And smaller values here are on the left hand side of the curve because we go from smaller and we increase to larger values here as we go right on the x axis. Okay, so again, coming back, my alternative hypothesis P is greater than 0.5. That means I'm curious about the area to the right. So what I've done so far in Excel with this normal distribution function, I found the cumulative area from the left. Then what can I do? I can take the total area under the distribution or one, and we take one minus the area from the left. That's really one minus this area I got from my normal distribution function. Then I can also set this up in Excel. So I take one minus my cumulative area from the left. And I found this cumulative area from the left by using this normal distribution function in Excel. I'm not interested in the area on the left, however, I'm interested in areas greater than that given z-score. How else do I know that? I looked here at my alternative hypothesis and I see this greater than symbol. So to find my true area of interest, the area to the right, I take one minus this value I get here. So I get a cumulative area to the right of that z-score that we figured out as our test statistic earlier in step six. Then I get the area to the right is equal to 0 0.0054. So again, area to the right, 0 0.0054. Then what I can finally say in step six is that with a right tailed test, with a test statistic of z is equal to 2.55, I find a p-value of 0 0.0054. These are all the steps I took to then just ultimately find my p-value here. And again, this z-score is from our test statistic earlier, and then this right-tailed test is what we just talked about, given this symbol here in our alternative hypothesis. Now, the book also provides this flowchart here on how to find your p-value. We applied these steps on our drone example, but you can apply this flowchart to any other question you come across. So we start here, we first decide, is it left-tailed or is it right-tailed? We can decide that by looking at the symbol notation in our alternative hypothesis and by thinking through what we're asked. If it's left-tailed, then we find the p-value is equal to the area to the left of the test statistic. For right-tailed, we find a p-value is the area to the right of the test statistic. This is what we just did in our drone example. Then in the middle, if it was neither left-tailed or right-tailed, then we had the two-tailed test. With the two-tailed test, we continued down this way in the flowchart. We ask, is the test statistic to the right or the left of the center point? In our case, the test statistic was a z-score. It can also be a t-score or a chi-squared value. If it's to the left, then we go to this side, the p-value is equal to twice the area to the left of the test statistic. Why is it twice the area to the left of the test statistic then? Well, remember, we're in the middle here, so we're dealing with two tailed tests. So if you found just this single area, you'd have to multiply this by two. Similarly here, if we're on the right-hand side, then the p-value is twice the area to the right of the test statistic. Why is it twice again? Well, we normally have one area over here and one area over here for these two tailed tests. So when we find just this one single area, we again need to multiply this by two to represent this area here and this area here. And again, here's this hint for deciding, is it left-tailed, right-tailed, or two-tailed? When we look at the alternative hypothesis, we can see that if we have this symbol of greater than, this points to the right, so the test is right-tailed. If we have this symbol of less than, then it points to the left, so the test is left-tailed. This is just one way of thinking about it, so think about it however it makes sense to you. If we have this symbol here of unequal to or not equal to, then we use that for our two-tailed and we go down the middle here in this flowchart. 
Some caution you should take when finding the p-value within step six is importantly, don't confuse our uppercase p-value here that we find in step six with the parameter p, the population proportion, or the statistic p hat, the sample proportion. Here's a summary of this notation. Don't get confused between each one. So our p-value, again, is the probability of a test statistic at least as extreme as the one obtained. The p-value represents the area there that we just looked at on the last few slides. Whereas lowercase p is our population proportion we're used to working with, and p hat, still lowercase p, but with a hat symbol above it, is the sample proportion. Okay, so with multiple meanings of the letter p here, just keep this really clear in your mind moving forward. Going back to this overview to keep in mind where we're at, so we just covered finding the p-value within step six. Now we're also gonna go through finding the critical value within step six. Keep in mind that either route, we had to find that test statistic value first. So in step six, let's define what a critical value is for this critical value method. In a hypothesis test, the critical value or plural values separates the critical region where we reject the null hypothesis from the values of the test statistic that do not lead to rejection of the null hypothesis. So again, it separates a region where we reject the null hypothesis from the values in the distribution, which would lead us to not rejecting the null hypothesis. Let's look at some examples of this to also give more context to this rather dense definition. So here, still within step six, critical values depend on the null hypothesis, the sampling distribution, and the significance level alpha. So we have critical values that establish our critical regions. For instance, the critical region is shaded in green here. Here's our critical region in green. What separates the critical region from the other data points in our distribution is this critical value. Now remember, we might see different values of our significance level alpha. There are some common values of alpha, however. So here, for a significantly high sample proportion, let's say we're gonna use this alpha value of 0.05. Again, other common values of alpha are 0 0.01, 0 0.1. Here, we're gonna use an alpha value of 0 0.05. Now, when we have an alpha value, let's refresh ourselves on how we'd end up solving for this critical value, which we're given here is Z is equal to 1.645. How we solve for this critical value in Excel would be understanding that the total area under the curve is one, with our given alpha value of 0.05, we take one minus 0.05, that's 0 0.095. So again, here in green is our critical region. That's also the same thing as our alpha value is 0.05. Because we always have to think in terms then of cumulative area from the left in order to use Excel, then we take one, the total area under the curve, minus this area here. So again, when we do that, we take one minus 0.05, we get 0.95. When we're working in z-scores, we know we can assume a standard normal distribution. So again, here we have a mean value of zero, a standard deviation value of one. Then if I wanna find my corresponding z-score, that's when we use the normal inverse function in Excel. For a normal inverse function in Excel, we need to plug in our probability slash area value, our mean and our standard deviation. From there, it will give us that corresponding z-score that separates this cumulative area from the left from this area. Here's how I set this all up. Then I click enter, I get a value of 1.645. That is the value shown here. I wanted to make sure I could definitely calculate that if I needed to. What I needed in order to calculate this critical value of Z is 1.645. I needed my alpha value. Then I also needed to know that I can assume a standard normal distribution. I also then of course needed to know what function to use in Excel. Here I use a normal inverse function to then identify the Z score 
that corresponds with a given probability or area value that's cumulative from the left. So putting this all together, this figure shows that with a significance level of alpha is equal to 0.05, we have a critical value of z is equal to 1.645. We were shown that, we also were able to calculate that in Excel. You could also use a table in your book to do the same thing. So here's when we had a general example, we were given an alpha value, we wanted to find this critical value. Connecting this back to our drone example. Well, from our drone example, we've already done a number of calculations. One is where we figured out our p hat value. Our p hat value is 0 0.540. We also already calculated our test statistic, which was our z value. We calculated that to be the more accurate version, so z equals 2.55. Remember, we found that more accurate version not by using this decimal form, but by using the full fraction for p hat. So now connecting the general example we saw on the last slide to our drone example, here's our same distribution here. Given an alpha value of 0.05, we get a critical value of 1.645. So now basically what we're doing is plotting this critical value for z from the generic example on the last slide along with this value of z that we have for our drone example. In comparing the two z-scores from our drone example, z is 2.55. That is a greater value of z from our last example of 1.645. So if we chose to plot these two z-scores on the same distribution as we're doing here, then this critical value of 1.645 would be further towards the left compared to 2.55. Why? It's because 2.55 is greater than 1.645. And remember, we start at lower values. Then as we're going along the x or the z axis, we start to increase the values here. So what we found previously was the test statistic and not the critical value. So what we did here was to find the actual critical value based on an alpha significance value. That's all we really needed to find the critical value. Note that the critical value depends on the alpha value as well as the sampling distribution and the null hypothesis. Okay, so in 8.1, there's some new notation here. There's a lot of new definitions. So far, we've gone up through the end of step six as I mentioned at the beginning, we've been building up into complexity here. So now we're putting a lot of concepts together within this chapter. Practice along with me on paper and in Excel. In part one, you saw this flow chart. We went through each step so far up to step six. Now in part two, we're gonna go through step seven and step eight and some additional background on hypothesis tests. I took this slide from part one to remind you where we left off with step six. So one thing we did in step six was we figured out for a right tailed test with a test statistic of z equal to 2.55, we calculated a p-value of 0 0.0054. To refresh you on steps five and six, the reason we calculated a test statistic of a z-value is because we are working with a proportion. So depending on if we had a proportion, a mean, a standard deviation or variance, that's when we decided which test statistic we need to calculate. So for a proportion, like in our drone example, which will continue on through part two now, we are working with a proportion. So we calculated a test statistic of Z and we calculated that to be the more accurate version of 2.55 where our slightly inaccurate version was 2.54. To get the more accurate version of 2.55, we used a p-hat value in the form of a fraction rather than in a decimal form. So that's the way we got a more accurate Z test statistic here in step six. An important piece of information we need to use to move on to step seven is this p-value. So our p-value was 0.0054. Also on this slide, we're reminded what our alternative hypothesis was, so p is greater than 0.5, and what our null hypothesis was, so p is equal to 
Let's set up what we do now in step seven. Here we're deciding, are we rejecting the null hypothesis or H naught, or are we failing to reject the null hypothesis H naught? Pay attention to the wording here. So we're either rejecting or we're failing to reject. We'll talk more about that terminology in a few slides from now. So in order to execute this step in step seven, using a P value specifically, our decision criteria is based on comparing our p-value to our alpha significance value. So in one case, if the p-value is less than or equal to our alpha significance value, then we reject the null hypothesis. One way to remember this, if p is low, the null hypothesis must go. Feel free to use that if you'd like or come up with a different way to remember this. Then the second option is if the p-value is greater than our alpha significance value, then we fail to reject the null hypothesis H0. So what do we need for step seven? We need our p-value that we calculated in step six. We also need our alpha value, our significance value. We touched on the alpha value in step four. Then we compare our p-value to our alpha value to be able to say, do we reject the null hypothesis or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? So with that background on step seven, let's apply this now to our drone example. As a reminder in step six, we got a p-value of 0.0054. Our alpha value for a significantly high sample proportion, we're gonna use alpha of 0.05. Remember, this is the most common alpha value to use, but pay attention if you're given a different alpha value to use. And one additional reminder, we get an alpha value by taking the confidence level, taking one minus the decimal form of our confidence level. You did that quite a bit in chapter seven. So we have our p-value, we have our alpha value. Now we compare these two and see which one's greater or which one's less, or are they equal? For our drone example, our p-value of 0.0054 is less than or equal to our alpha value of 0.05. Remember the only options in step seven are either less than or equal to or greater than. Now, if we decided our p-value is less than or equal to our alpha value, then we have this case where we know we need to reject the null hypothesis. The P is low, the null hypothesis must go. We reject the null hypothesis. Then so far in step seven, we can say for our drone delivery example, we reject the null hypothesis. In step eight now, we want to restate the decision using simple and non-technical terms. Why would we want to do this? Well, typically we want to avoid using jargon so then our statistical methods and our results can be more widely understood by the general audience. For example, if we were to report this conclusion that we reject the null hypothesis, that doesn't really have a lot of meaning if we we're reading this statement in a newspaper or an article, for example. And so before moving on to step eight, we could have also used the critical value method to determine a conclusion from step seven. So using the critical value method, the way we can say if we reject or fail to reject the null hypothesis is by comparing the test statistic to the critical region. If the test statistic falls within the critical region, we reject the null hypothesis if it does not, then we failed to reject the null hypothesis. And so in our case, in the drone example, the test statistic is Z is equal to 2.55, and the critical region starts at Z is equal to 1.645. Thus, the test statistic value of Z equals 2.55 does fall within the critical region. Therefore, we also here conclude that we reject the null hypothesis. So we can do this by the critical value method and the p-value method, whichever route you wanna take. So now in step eight, without using technical terms not understood by most people, 
we want to state a final conclusion that addresses the original claim with wording that can be understood by those without knowledge of statistical procedures. We want our findings to be digestible, to be understandable by anyone reading them and not just somebody who's recently taken a statistics class. Now, possibly unsurprisingly, completing step eight can actually be rather complicated, but we can take some steps to then rephrasing our conclusion from step seven into understandable terms. Some steps in doing this are understanding that the conclusions are based on the original claim. We'll go back and apply step eight to our drone example like we've been doing the whole time, but remember that conclusions are based on the original claim. What's important to recognize is that our original claim may be the null or alternative hypothesis. In other words, the original claim is not always our null hypothesis. It's also not always our alternative hypothesis. So we need to figure out what our original claim is and then also decide is it our null or our alternative hypothesis. So as just stated, our original claim is either our alternative or our null hypothesis. We will talk about how to decide this. In general wording, we would insert our original claim here, which we'll go back to with our drone example, and then we decide is it the null or the alternative hypothesis. So all these bullet points basically say the same thing, and we'll talk about how to do this in our example. So now coming back to our drone example, a reminder from step seven is we decided we would reject the null hypothesis. Now in terms of step eight, we remember that conclusions are based on the original claim. What we saw on the last slide is that we need to decide is our original claim the null or is it the alternative hypothesis? Then we connect that back to step seven. Going back to the beginning of chapter eight, remembering that our original claim for this drone example is that the majority of consumers are not comfortable with drone deliveries. Remember we talked about this here and how we interpret this word majority. So here the majority claim is equivalent to the claim that the proportion is greater than half. So we decided that our claim would be that P is greater than 0.5. Okay, so in step eight, we had to go back. What was our original claim again? Well, here it is. Now we can decide, is it our null or our alternative hypothesis? As a reminder, our alternative hypothesis or H1 was that P is greater than 0.5. We looked at these originally back on step three. Then our null hypothesis or H0 is that P is equal to 0.5. If you need a refresher on figuring out what is the null and what was our alternative hypothesis, definitely go back to step three. That was all in 8.1 part one. Now that we've listed our original claim and we've listed our alternative and our null hypotheses, it should be clear that our original claim is actually our alternative hypothesis. So now we're at the point of saying our original claim that the majority of consumers are not comfortable with drone deliveries is our alternative hypothesis. Now, the two big pieces of information we need moving forward from here is this bullet point here, and then connecting us back to what we figured out in step seven, that we need to reject the null hypothesis. This is keeping in mind that our original claim was our alternative hypothesis. So here are those bullet points again. Now let's connect all of this. We'll look at a more expanded version of this table, but we'll use this part of the table to then make a conclusion for our drone delivery example. In looking at this table and how to interpret this, in step seven, because we decided we would reject the null hypothesis, then we start in this column here. We rejected H0, we rejected the null hypothesis. Now, the next piece of information we use here in this table is that our original claim is actually our alternative hypothesis or H1. Because we connect this back to our original claim, which is actually our alternative hypothesis or H1, then we look here in the table. 
The general form of the statement here is there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that, and we insert our original claim there. Let's use our original claim and plug that in to make our conclusion for step eight. Therefore, there is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the majority of consumers are uncomfortable or not comfortable with drone deliveries. And again, we will look at a slightly expanded version of this table. For our specific case here, we rejected the null hypothesis and our original claim was the alternative hypothesis. That's how we knew to use this box here to make our final conclusion for step eight for our drone example. So we just worded our conclusion for our drone example in step eight. Let's talk more about wording our final conclusion for all sorts of examples, not just when we reject the null hypothesis and our original claim is the alternative hypothesis. This can be tricky, so for help in wording our final conclusion, we can refer to the table that's on the next slide. Again, that's the more expanded version of the table we just looked at on the last slide. You'll see when we get to that table, there are four possible circumstances and we'll see their corresponding conclusions. One thing you'll notice in the table is that for the first case only out of the four possible circumstances, it's the only case leading to wording indicating support for the original conclusion. We'll look at that in the table on the next slide. A consideration because of this is that if we want to support some claim, then what we should do is to state it in such a way that it becomes our alternative hypothesis. If our original claim is our alternative hypothesis, then we can hope that the null hypothesis gets rejected. That was true for the case we just looked at for our drone example. So again, keep in mind, if we want to support some claim, we should design our question so that our original claim becomes our alternative hypothesis rather than our null hypothesis. What do I mean by that? Well, here's this first case I was talking about. In only this first case and only this first row would we be able to say that there is sufficient evidence to support the original claim. That's why we should design our studies to make our original claim our alternative hypothesis instead. Why is that again? Well, look at these other three conclusions. In the second one here, there is not sufficient evidence to support the original claim. So in this one, we could not confirm our original claim. In this third row, we actually reject the original claim because here the conclusion is there is sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of our original claim. Then in the fourth row, we can't confirm our original claim. What we can do is say there is not sufficient evidence to warrant an outright rejection of that claim. So there's only one possibility here where we actually support our original claim. That's why we should design our statistical example to make our original claim actually our alternative hypothesis. Key points to remember in this table is we make our conclusion in reference to our original claim. Also, as you saw from step seven, we use evidence to either reject our H naught, our null hypothesis, or we fail to reject H naught, our null hypothesis. So these conditions are always in reference to our null hypothesis, either rejecting or failing to reject then our conclusions always take into account our original claim itself. So we practice doing this for our drone example. I'll also go through some key steps that we've already seen for our drone example. So we did these key steps, but let's go ahead and list them out. So we needed to decide if our original claim contains an equality. What are we doing here? Well, we're essentially deciding if our original claim is the null or the alternative hypothesis. This null or alternative hypothesis is one way of thinking about it. We can also think about this in terms of does our original claim contain an equality?
Why would that be one of the key steps here? Well, you can see in the condition here, the original claim does not include inequality. That's true of these first two rows. And then in the second two rows, we see the claim includes inequality. Why is finding out if the original claim contains inequality or not essentially the same thing as deciding if our original claim is the null or the alternative hypothesis? Well, if you remember from step three, our alternative hypothesis H1 is the one that does not contain inequality. Then our null hypothesis H0 is the symbolic expression that the parameter equals some fixed value being considered. Remember for our drone example, our null hypothesis is that P is equal to 0.5. So let's connect these. If the original claim does not include inequality, then the original claim is the alternative hypothesis. Then in these two rows, the original claim includes inequality. That means our original claim is our null hypothesis. Then on the previous version of the table you saw for our drone example, we can use language of either support or reject. Okay, so consider all these conditions carefully and then go to our conclusion and then make sure you use this proper wording and then insert your original claim here. Again, this is always in reference to our null hypothesis. These conclusions are always in reference to our original claim. We've also done this now in step seven. So either we're rejecting H0 or we're failing to reject H0. We did that in step seven. That was comparing our p-value to our significance value alpha. What I recommend doing here is writing out all these steps really clearly and then making sure you go through them to keep all the wording straight. Now, I mentioned we come back to this. Do we accept or do we fail to reject the null hypothesis? In statistics, we say fail to reject the null hypothesis rather than saying we accept the null hypothesis. Okay, so again from step seven, we either reject the null hypothesis or we fail to reject the null hypothesis you will not say that we accept the null hypothesis. We either reject or we fail to reject. Why is that? Well, this word accept can be misleading. It incorrectly implies that the null hypothesis has been proven, but in actuality, we can never truly prove a null hypothesis. So again, we don't say we accept the null hypothesis. We can say we fail to reject the null hypothesis. This phrase failed to reject says more correctly that the available evidence isn't strong enough to warrant rejection of the null hypothesis. Okay, so failed to reject, we don't have enough evidence to flat out reject the null hypothesis, so we failed to reject the null hypothesis. It's sort of a glass is half empty, half full kind of thing. Again, we say fail to reject or we just reject it rather than saying we accept the null hypothesis. Now, again, likely unsurprisingly, again, this could get confusing with fail to reject. Do we have these multiple negatives here? Well, in our conclusions, we could have up to three negative terms. This will make it really difficult to read and interpret what we actually mean. It's basically like using a double negative. Like saying, I don't dislike s'mores, right? I should just say, I like s'mores. So in statistics, if we have these confusing conclusions, it's better to restate them to actually be understandable. For example, instead of saying there is not sufficient evidence to warrant rejection of the claim of no difference between 0.5 and the population proportion, that's confusing, right? There's not sufficient evidence to warrant rejection. A better statement for this would be until stronger evidence is obtained, we will continue to assume that the population proportion is equal to 0.5. These are the same thing, right? Because this claim of no difference between 0.5 and the population proportion, 
we don't have enough evidence to reject that claim. This is a technically true statistical statement, but to make this more understandable, we can reword it like this. Now, another big concept in statistics is dealing with type one and type two errors. As we go into this part of 8.1, we're done with the steps for hypothesis tests. Now we're moving into discussion on errors. Let's define type one and type two errors. A type one error is the mistake of rejecting the null hypothesis when it's actually true. This symbol we've seen before of alpha, and I wrote this down here as well, so this is alpha, this notation is beta. We'll use beta when defining type two errors. So we use the symbol alpha to represent the probability of a type one error. We've looked at alpha before in step four, so remember that alpha is our significance level. We also previously defined it as alpha is equal to the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis H0 when H0 is true. That's the same wording we've seen. So now connecting this to type one errors, alpha is the probability of a type one error which is all equal to the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. That was a type one error. Now let's define a type two error. A type two error is the mistake of failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually false. We're gonna use the symbol beta here to represent the probability of a type two error. So beta is equal to the probability of a type two error, which is all equal to the probability of failing to reject H naught, the null hypothesis, when H naught is actually false. So again, here in type one, the null hypothesis is actually true, but we reject the null hypothesis. Whereas for type two errors, the null hypothesis is actually false, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis. Using this table is a helpful way to organize what we just talked about. Let's start here. So let's say we concluded to reject the null hypothesis in step seven. If the null hypothesis is truly false, then we made the correct decision. However, if we decided to reject the null hypothesis, then we'd have a type one error if our null hypothesis is actually true. Let's go down here now. So let's say from step seven, we failed to reject the null hypothesis. If we failed to reject the null hypothesis and the null hypothesis is true, then we made the correct decision. The null hypothesis is true and we didn't reject it. But if we failed to reject the null hypothesis and actually if the null hypothesis is false, then we made a type two error. And the notation here again, the probability of a type one error is represented by alpha and the probability of a type two error is represented by beta. We're gonna practice wording these type one and type two errors. Here's a hint for describing these different kinds of errors. So descriptions of type one and type two refer to the null hypothesis being either true or false. But when wording a statement representing either a type one or a type two error, be sure the conclusion actually addresses the original claim. Remember what we saw in step eight where the original claim may or may not be the null hypothesis. The original claim could also be our alternative hypothesis. So within wording these errors, we need to be sure the conclusion addresses the original claim. Let's practice this. So here's an example of describing type one and type two errors. Let's consider the claim that a medical procedure designed to increase the likelihood of having a baby girl is effective. That means the probability of having a baby girl is greater than half, it's greater than 0.5. Then given the null and the alternative hypotheses, we will practice writing statements describing a type one error in part A and a type two error in part B.
Here's our null hypothesis. P is equal to 0.5. Remember, our null hypothesis has that equality symbol there. Our alternative hypothesis in this case is H1. That's P is greater than 0.5. Note that we don't have an equality symbol here for our alternative hypothesis. Based on that hint on the last slide and describing type one and type two errors, we need to be sure that we come back to our original claim. One important step we did already here is see that our original claim is actually our alternative hypothesis. Let's solve this now. So here's our original setup. We're first gonna talk through part A and describing a type one error. As we're getting used to what these errors are, let's remind ourselves that a type one error is the mistake of rejecting a true null hypothesis. Let's look at what our null hypothesis is. So we're saying the probability of getting a girl is 0.5. For a type one error, the null hypothesis is true. The probability of getting a girl is equal to 0.5. In a type one error though, we reject that true null hypothesis. Therefore, in reality, the probability of having a girl is equal to 0.5, but sample evidence leads us to conclude that the probability is greater than 0.5. Why did we come back to saying that sample evidence leads us to conclude that probability is greater than 0.5? Well, remember we need to connect that back to our original claim. Let's try wording this in a non-statistical way. So in this case, a type one error would be to conclude that the medical procedure is effective when in reality, it has no effect. How we're describing effectiveness here is that we're increasing our likelihood of having a baby girl. So in a type one error, we would think that the probability actually is greater than half to have a baby girl but in actuality, the probability is still just 0.5. It's a 50-50 chance of having a baby girl or a baby boy. That's how we describe type one errors. Remember to come back to our original claim here in the wording of a type one error. Let's try type two now. To remind ourselves, a type two error is the mistake of failing to reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is actually false. Again, for the same example, the null hypothesis is that the probability is 0.5. The probability of having a girl is 0.5. The probability of having a boy is 0.5. It's a 50-50 chance. So in a type two error, this null hypothesis would be false. So what we're doing is we're failing to reject the null hypothesis. Therefore, in reality, the probability of having a girl is actually greater than 0.5. But in a type two error, we actually fail to support that conclusion. Going back to our hint, did we connect this wording back to our original claim? Yes, we did here. For our type two error, this probability is greater than 0.5. That's our original claim. That's already in the wording we have here for our type two error. So again, the probability is actually greater than 0.5, but here we failed to reject that. So here again, our null hypothesis is false, but we failed to reject that. The probability really isn't 50-50, but we failed to reject that. That's a type two error. In different wording here again, in this case, a type two error is to conclude that the medical procedure has no effect when in actuality, it really is effective in increasing the likelihood of having a baby girl. The probability really is greater than 0.5. So as you've seen so far, chapter eight, section one has a lot of new material. So definitely work on your MyStatLab homework to practice problems in using and applying this new knowledge. Always feel free to email me and or call into office hours with any questions you have. I hope you're all doing well. I'll talk to you next time for 8.2.